Thanks very much. I appreciate the opportunity to come and uh, address uh, this, this group. And I had talked to Ken earlier about the kind of things that we were involved with in this metamorphic manufacturing, and he thought it would be a great thing to share with the community. So I'm happy to do that. So I'm from Case um, in the Material Science and Engineering Department, but I also have a secondary appointment in Mechanical Engineering. So you'll see the kind of blend of things that I'm going to be talking about here. So, I was involved over the last maybe year and a half with a workshop that was looking at this concept of metamorphic manufacturing, which I'll get into in a bit more detail, but for right now, think of it as robotic blacksmithing. And we know what blacksmithing is, but now how would you automate that? And I'll give some examples of that. And the idea is, could this be the third wave of digital manufacturing? And I'll go in through the evolution of this kind of concept in particular and why this is the right time. Uh, this was led by TMS, which is a technical society, the Materials Society, and it was done on behalf of funding that was provided by the Office of Naval Research, because they have a lot of interest, as do a number of the DOD, Department of Defense agencies, in this concept. And it was also co-sponsored, if you will, by what's called the LIFT Manufacturing Institute, Lightweight Innovations for Tomorrow, LIFT. And that was one of the National Network for Manufacturing Institutes that was commissioned under the Obama administration that still carries on. And so I'm going to cover this in some detail, starting off with the study team to give you a sense of who was involved. So this was an invited group of people that represented academia. The leader in this case was Glenn Dane from Ohio State University. He is one of the pillar leaders of this LIFT Institute. He has interests similar to mine, material science and engineering, but also how do you deform materials into certain kinds of shapes. And so he was leading it from LIFT with sponsorship from the Office of Naval Research. But if you look at the other people involved, there's a number of different academics, not only from the US, but from abroad to, be, to give a broad perspective of this approach. But then very importantly, a couple of government agencies. Howard Sizek, group leader at the Air Force Research Laboratory, kind of representing the aerospace side of this issue and Johnny DeLoach from the Office of Naval Research that is representing the naval aspects. Now Johnny was very interesting because he was involved with the very first stages of LIFT. In this case, he was on the original team that created the LIFT Manufacturing Institute and was present at the White House when Obama announced this. And so this is the linkage to that Manufacturing Institute and also you know, trying to take it forward into the next kind of thing. Uh, so you can see, if you start to look at the various people involved and you look at their CVs, there's metals people, mechanical engineers, robotics, forging, manufacturing, including additives, so that we could compare and contrast what this technology brings that is different, welding, deformation, and some machines. Uh, many of the people have programs of their own that are relevant in a certain sector of what I'm going to talk about. So in kind of putting this in perspective, it's a relatively new concept. Uh, the technology itself, integrating it, is relatively in its infancy. Uh, again, as I indicated, this was conceived by personnel at the LIFT, Glenn Dane and some of his collaborators, and supported by the Office of Naval Research. Now, as many of you are comfortable and familiar with various aspects of manufacturing, a number of the core elements that I'm going to talk about exist. In, in very uh, high precision already. But what's lacking is the integration of, of all of those. And that brings in the Internet of Things kind of concept that I'll be talking about. So the full vision hasn't been realized yet, and the approach of this team was to try to put it in perspective of what might be needed nationally, in some cases, to help this happen. And so this is, again, robotic blacksmithing. So if I put that in perspective, if we think of a blacksmith, which is a manufacturing process. These elements that I'm going to describe exist in the blacksmith, but now it's the question of how would you do this robotically or otherwise. So you're going to see these again later, S, T, A, R, and C. So if we start with S, sensors, in the blacksmith, the sensors are his eyes. He's got to, when he's forging whatever he's doing, uh, see the color of the metal or perhaps even be able to sense when he hits it uh, how much force it's taking to deform it. And we'll talk about that later too. You have the thermal side of it, and the team liked the um, dragon, so we put that in rather than a furnace. And so there's got to be some type of thermal to heat the material up to its temperature to get it eventually so that you can deform it enough. 
A is actuators, which in the blacksmith is him providing some physical force multiple times in this case to create the object. A, uh, actuator then followed by R, the, robo the robotic aspect. So he uses his second hand to position the component. And as we look at this in the future, this could be done robotically. And then finally, although potentially integrated, is the computational side of it. So I'll go through these later with the opportunities for the community that the team identified in each of these kinds of areas. Uh, the, ro the robot person can make quite unique things. Damascus steel blades are still very unique, very high performance, both visually as well as uh, performance characteristics, but each one is a bit different. And so the question is, how could you automate this kind of thing? So what is metamorphic manufacturing? Well, what we would like to try to do is have a closed loop type of system that might be numerically controlled and incrementally form something. Well, and we'll give examples of what those things might be to make a complex shape that had specific properties. And since I come from the materials community, uh, what kind of microstructure? So if you looked inside the material, what does it look like? It's changing very dramatically depending on how you deform it. So here's our regular blacksmith. We would like to be able to do this robotically. So it combines incremental forming of your metal smith with precision and control, using now intelligent machines that could somehow be linked, that we'll give examples of. And so if one could do that, then you could be able to make everything the same every time if you wanted it. The productivity would go off, and the agility, manufacturing agility, would also be enhanced. So as I indicated, a number of the individual segments of this exist, but they haven't been integrated. And that's where the team both the government people as well as some of the international representatives indicated that this could be potentially disruptive. And obviously, who optimizes this will have some strategic advantage in a variety of different areas. So this third wave of digital manufacturing builds on the previous ones. The first wave, CNC machining, late 1940s. that had a tremendous impact, but it's a subtractive technology. The second wave, and this one's kind of going through another wave right now, in the early 80s, uh, 3D printing and additive manufacturing. And that's come now, again, back in a, a little bit of a different and more advanced way than it, it started. And that's one of the national networks for manufacturing initiatives also that Case and others, Cleveland State, participate in. And so that's shown here. But the third wave now is instead of CNC, which is subtractive, or additive, MM is based on really incremental deformation forming, forming of components, but doing it incrementally. And that provides a number of different advantages. It enables agile, rapid, and affordable production of high quality metallic parts that could be small or big. And it lends itself to both small businesses, medium, as well as the large companies that could have interest in these different segments. It could be very effective for small batches and highly customized parts. And I'll come to some examples that are currently existing somewhat on a small scale um, to give you kind of a sense what people have done or are starting to think about. So the metamorphic manufacturing study, uh, I gave a link in my abstract, I'll show again where you can get access to this, is a report that summarizes this. The study team met over about a year and a half, uh, got input from a variety of places, and then also this was vetted in the community to get some input. And so the goal was to try to jumpstart this development. And so how to do that? The government agencies that were involved were specifically on there because they can help implement funding through either universities or other places that can help leverage what they are interested in in certain topic areas and provide funding to start this, either at universities or collaborations between universities and companies. So, the report kind of identifies the value proposition, what are some of the fundamental underlying technologies that I'm going to cover, and then there are some challenges and needs, and part of that hopefully can be uh, facilitated by providing funding to access and attack some of these challenges. So there's some developed recommendations and detailed action plans that I'll share with you. Uh, there was a time limit put on this because they did want to you know, put some bounds on what could be shown in a couple of years uh, in this type of area. 
And so if you read through that, uh, you'll see that it's quite broad in its coverage. And it's not just engineer technology things. There are other issues in this that have more societal kind of concepts also um, that you know, will bring this to fruition. So the value proposition, first of all, there's three categories that we kind of bounded this. Um, and the first of all, these would be environmental and economically friendly. If I take a piece of metal and I keep deforming it into shape, I don't lose any of that metal. And so there may be benefits on lower material waste in that sense. I might, if I do this right, I might not need as many dyes. When I start to deform something uh, into a shape, uh, I usually need lots of dyes. But if I could do this right, I could minimize the number of those dyes. And if I do it in what's called an open dye forging, that I'll show you an example of, uh, then I have no dyes. And that may be very beneficial in some cases. So I would have reduced energy consumption. The second of these is shape and property control. I'm making a shape or a product, and so there are some benefits in this regime, both with how big I could make something, uh, it could be quite complex, and the nice thing about using deformation is I can put it where I want it, particularly if I have a robot placing it in its position, and I can vary the material properties in a very controlled way if this is integrated properly. And finally, superior manufacturing flexibility and accessibility. So now one could extend this to a lot of different material systems, uh, small batch production and larger, and perhaps shorten the lead time because you're getting nearly a final shape as part of this and not machining it at the end. So it's based on incremental deformation. This is one of the fundamental underlying technologies. And so there's a couple of examples of this that are people are working in the US as well as abroad. So this is one. If I have a sheet of metal, uh, how do I get it into a dome shape? I could stamp it into that shape, and that would be on one hit. But I could do it incrementally in the way that's shown here, double-sided incremental forming. And so now I use tools in this kind of configuration, and I incrementally make that dome shape, which may have some advantages from the materials perspective and from how much force you need to do and use to make that. So that's in the US, that's going on at Northwestern in a, in a university laboratory. Uh, abroad, uh, Erman Takaya's group, who was on this study panel, is interested in tube forming. And so in this case, you can have tubes, but maybe you don't want that tube to be straight for its application. You could bend it as part of the tube making operation. And so this part goes at the end, and now you get your bent tube as part of the manufacturing process. That takes out one or two of the steps. If you take that to a different case, you could imagine incremental forging. So now I may have quite a large part that I want to squash in different directions, but if I have robotic control, then I can squash it once in one direction, have the robot pick it and turn it on its side and squash it again. And so those are some examples, again, from that same group. Now, this has been done partly uh, internationally on larger scale. This is a group, uh, Amata, robotic bending machines, that one of the team members on this study team, David Bourne, from the CMU Robotics Institute, he was part of the study team and was involved with Amata in Japan, where they wanted to implement this. And this happened quite a number of years ago. Started in 1990 through 2007. This is quite a big machine now with robotic interface that could make these kinds of parts. It's not in the US in this case. He was involved, commissioned by them, to help automatically determine from a CAD design, determine the operation sequence of how you could get to this starting from a sheet of metal. And so this was already being thought about. Robotic grippers, tool layout, robot motion plans. So it's not exactly met metamorphic manufacturing, but it has some, ink, uh, some aspects of it. And so in this case, they had sensors to gauge the part geometries. They could adjust the bend angle from this, which was originally a straight sheet, and then compensate when you bend something. After you take the force off, it always springs back a little bit. And so this really is an incremental forming, but many of the features that were captured in this work uh, lend itself to the kind of things in this metamorphic manufacturing. You have potentially a machine's flexibility, an automatic process program, 
and in-process sensors that allow you to adjust potentially on the fly. Now, this is a proof of concept. It's not metal-based, but the lift team had a prize. And their idea was students demonstrate this on a simple material. Plasticine is a material, like clay, that's used often to simulate what happens in a metal. And so the, the challenge was to make a horseshoe and a flange, but not machine it, use this incremental forming. And so what you're looking at the top and bottom is on plasticine that a group at Ohio State had done. And so you'll see the evolution of this with the end goal being this, without any machining. And so using this incremental process of forming, forging, however you want to call it, in a number of steps that's controlled, that you start just squashing the material, but then you pull out and have some die sets that you can use, like here. So you're going to make the hole in this case, incrementally. Um, there's the evolving horseshoe. And on the right is kind of a large scale uh, forging operation where we have red hot metal that's being squashed into a shape, but obviously not into a complex shape in this case. But you can see that you can get there. And this was just to demonstrate the process. There was a prize put out for the team of students that could do this. And it captures a number of the things that I've talked about. You start with a bulk piece of material, in this case plasticine, which mimics the behavior of metals quite well in many cases, and then do it robotically. So the fundamental elements, I've kind of captured these already. In the blacksmith, you have sensors, thermal, actuators, robots, and computation. So I talked about sensors and thermal already. If we think about actuators and who could be involved with this, well, I need something that's going to provide the incremental deformation. And so that could be hydraulic presses, high-speed hammers, rollers, depending on what kind of product you're trying to make. And that certainly lends itself to the community around Northeast Ohio that there's lots of potential actuator type companies. Uh, you need removable and exchangeable tools because perhaps the robot could pick up the tool, use one, make part of the process, put the tool back, pick a different tool later. And that would have to be integrated. And the nice thing about doing that is you can kind of minimize the amount of space on the manufacturing floor. You also need some type of robotic manipulation. And this could be either large or small again. In the Amata process that I showed, the robots are quite big. But you could imagine doing this on a desktop also. So those manipulators provide excellent precision and control, reproducibility. The workpiece positioning can be driven by CAD CAM software. You could have some types of sensors that might be thermal or surface roughness or something like that, and temperature controls. The computation side of it then is the computational brain. In the blacksmith, it was the blacksmith's brain. But now we need something perhaps with artificial intelligence that can machine learn as I'm deforming something and I'm monitoring all this data that comes in, how much force it takes to deform it, how hot it's getting. I could integrate all that information and like the human blacksmith, learn how to better make it the next time. And so if you do all that, and I'll show this in a second, the team had a concept of what this might look like. Uh, you could track with time, if that's the thing that I want to make, uh, you could track temperature, how much deformation is in it, the stresses that are put into it. Like the Ohio State team that was deforming the plasticine, now do it on a metallic component. And you'd like to be able to predict some of the properties downstream also. So here was the concept that the team came up with that was vetted around the community. So again, you have these elements, stark, so we got to start with sensors. So if you think of the sensors, well, I could have optical sensors if I want to see what the surface looks like. I could have thermal sensors if I care about the temperature. And there may be other sensors that I could put that give me some details of how the material is evolving. So that's S. The thermal side, you know, we normally think of this as you know, having a material in the furnace, the robot takes it, puts it on the 
top and then I do something else to it. So we have the thermal side, but that could be done in situ also, perhaps with induction heating or some other type of technique. So I got sensors and thermal, I need some actuator. If I'm gonna get this into shape, like the plasticine, I need actuators to provide force to start to deform it into whatever shape that I desire. I've got the R, the robotic control. This has multiple functions now, either taking it out of the furnace and putting it into that position, or maybe if it gets a little bit too cold, I gotta put it back in again. So there's some integration between some of these things to get this to happen. And then finally, but integrated along the process, would be the computational side. So there is the human computer interface, but hopefully again with machine learning, you can start to optimize this and take out some of the steps. And so that's the idea. So I indicated that there are challenges and needs of highest priority, and then how do you address that? So the team came up with seven category areas. There were others that were identified that if you read the report, you'll see the others that didn't rise to the top of the list, but are in the report, because there are other things that are important just beyond this. But certainly, how do I do this? Are there standards and specification on the robot, on the thermal sensors, and others? The design, modeling, and simulation. If I'm going to integrate this, what kinds of models lend themselves to integrating the information that I'm going to need? The materials, behavior, and characterization. The thing that I'm really interested in is, once I make this thing, what kind of performance characteristics does it have? And what kind of testing needs to be done to demonstrate that? Sensors and process controls, we've mentioned those of various types. The value proposition assessment, and then obviously, people are going to have to be trained to do this for the individual bits and then also for the integration. So the over opportunity areas that the team came up with was to build awareness, first of all. So the report has been issued. That literally just came out a month ago. And people like myself and the other, other team members are giving talks like this at various technical symposia to get people aware of what's coming downstream because the government agencies that were involved probably will be putting out requests for proposals in a number of areas that I'll describe. Standards and specifications, as I indicated, will be important. Modeling and simulations, as I've already highlighted. There's gonna be some technology demonstrations and benchmarks that are need to demonstrate this at a variety of different size scales that will probably be funded by government agencies, either on small business, innovative research, STTRs for the smaller businesses, and then at the larger scale for the national laboratories. Sensors and data analytics and how to integrate those, maybe new sensors are needed, and then obviously some type of workforce training. And so for each opportunity area, that report provides some broad recommendations with dollar amounts on them, so you can see the kind of things that the team thinks will be required. In some of these cases for desktops, it may be tens of thousands to 100. At the national labs with the very big kind of projects, these may be multi-million dollar projects. And so there are a number of action plans to launch a benchmarking and modeling effort to build prototype MM process suites. So at the government laboratories, these will be quite large. At, there may be a couple at universities that are smaller in scale that demonstrate this, and this would be a great opportunity for collaboration amongst the people in the room and the two universities. Uh, at the smallest scale, there's going to be interest in a benchtop model. For those of you that know about additive manufacturing and the MakerBots, the idea is to have something like a MakerBot but uses this concept, small. So develop internships. The companies that are going to be involved here will be interested in having interns, student interns and others, to come to their facilities to do this. Uh, we brought up, importantly, the importance of small organizations. Um, so fortunately, uh, Ken Laparo was able to share with me the website to the Internet of Things and the IoT Collaborative. So if you read that report in the additional reading side of it, the website is listed. And so as that gets updated and people look at this, they'll see what's happening in this community. That's not happening so much yet around the country, so we're leading in that regard. So it's a good thing to take advantage of. Uh, there's some grand challenges that are presented in there. And then as I indicated, there is interest in creating a desktop prototype machine that, again, small businesses could become involved with. So the detailed action plans are shown there. Multiple tax, tasks and tactics are provided with estimates of what budget numbers might be required here. Uh, many of the details are fleshed out. Time frames also. SBIRs, nine months. STTRs, 
phase one and two longer term. So all these work together to try to get this to the next stage. So how can you get involved broadly? Uh, so that's the report. Uh, in my abstract, I provided the link to it. Uh, I'll do that again at the end. Um, what you, again, I hope you can sense is that this is beyond science and engineering. There's a number of different aspects here that reach out to the number of things that Jay will talk about after me that really get the whole community involved. And so free, feel free to reach out to me. I can give you the contact information of the other people on that committee that's also listed in the report. And um, for those of you that are going to be in Portland, Oregon in October, there's a meeting, the first one of this sort, international, where we're going to have people come from wherever they are and say what they're doing in this area. So we'll get a good sense of a cross-section of what's going on around the world. Uh, and it'll be all those areas that I described. I have no idea what we're going to see yet. The abstracts are coming in. We can report back to you after because we're going to go present something. Ken, another faculty member at Case, Roger Quinn and I are putting together something to try to highlight some of the things that are going on between our institutions. Uh, that's the website in the longer term. So there's the digital copies of the report that you can get. Uh, that's what it looks like. Um, and I'll leave the questions for afterward because uh, Jay is up next. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks, John.